compassion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we are digging into a study on the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to be taking our time as we go through this. But this morning we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to open them up to Matthew uh, chapter 5. And the, the Sermon on the Mount is actually covered between Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 7 in those three chapters. So we're going to take our time, like I said before, and we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, and we'll be starting in verse 1. As you turn to it, for those of you that are home as well, we, we thank you for tuning in and turn to your Bible, please. We will be going through this a verse at a time, uh, so we won't be reading it in one chunk all at the beginning, but certainly turn to it and, so, and have a little notepad beside you so you can take some notes, not just from what the pastor says, but from what God is saying to you as you read through his word. This is core teaching. Jesus had um, taken a long time to prepare for his earthly ministry. We see little snippets of him in the gospel throughout his growing years and where he was in the temple and he taught a little bit while he was in the temple and people thought they were really impressed by such a, a young man speaking about God, actually a, a preteen or, or teenager speaking about God and they were quite impressed by him. But we don't really see core teachings being brought about by Jesus until we get to the Sermon on the Mount. This is after he was baptized by John, asking John to baptize him. And after he was tempted in the desert, uh, where um, Satan challenged him with the word, uh, and he responded with the word of God correctly and sharply, and was able to uh, show himself worthy of someone that can handle God's word, but also the one who brings the wisdom of God himself. And when he began this teaching, he began with a group of spectators in the background and a group of disciples close to him. He gathered on a mountainside. This was not a religious gathering. He, didn't, he wasn't the guest speaker at the temple that week. He instead went out and he was amongst the, what we would call the masses. He was amongst a, a general crowd. And he went up to them and he began to sit before them and teach. So uh, here's where we're going to begin. And it starts in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. It says this, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them. And, and like I said, um, as we see, this is uh, the starting of this uh, whole gathering, the beginning of his teaching, and uh, there's a few key things in this passage which sounds very straightforward, but just want to flesh out a little bit more. The first thing I want you to see is that after he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and then he called his disciples to him when he was seated. Now, you and I go, yeah, okay, he was seated. That's not a big deal. Well, it kind of is, because Jesus was about to begin teaching. And as he was teaching, he was viewed as a teacher. And in the Jewish uh, context, a teacher was called a rabbi. And when a rabbi was teaching his students uh, or the people that were following him, sometimes he would walk around and talk with them. But when he sat down, the students went, okay, here's come some, some serious teaching. So without having to say, hey, everybody, listen up, or <laughs> class, class, he simply sat down. And when he sat down, a hush followed amongst his disciples, and they went, okay, this is when it gets serious. We see that as reinforced, this official teaching is reinforced when he opens his mouth. Um, now, it could have said when he was seated, his disciples came to him, then he said, da 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 But instead it says, then he opened his mouth. Well, opened his mouth, said, isn't that the same thing? Kind of, except... This is a phrase that's often used uh, to describe when someone is sharing something deep from the heart or deep even from God. For example, a prophet would speak from their mouth. Uh, someone that was coming to bring a message from God would speak from their mouth. Someone that had a heartfelt message to give to someone would speak from their mouth. This is a, a common phrase that would be used in Greek. And so when he opened up his mouth to speak, it was also a sign that this was going to be very serious, uh, very important, very listen-up kind of teaching that he's going to give. 
And then it says, he taught them. Okay, Perry, are you really just dragging this out? I'm trying not to, honestly. But when he said he taught them, there is a verb form that's used there. So, so grammar people, I think you're one. <laughs> grammar people know that in the past tense, there's a couple of word, a couple of phrases you can use. There's the aorist tense or aorist tense, depending upon how good your English is. And that means that something is completed. Like he swept the floor. Okay, that he did a job, and in that tense, it swept the floor. The floor is swept. It's already done. It's already completed. And he's done it once. But there's also another tense that's called the imperfect tense. That means he's something he's done, but he's done it over and over and over again. So to say that um, Sheridan taught math, you could say, well, that means Sheridan at one point, at one day, on one, on one situation, taught math to a person in a situation. That's what taught could mean. Or if you say Sheridan taught math, it could be Sheridan has spent over a decade teaching math every day to his students. This is the imperfect tense, which implies that as Jesus is teaching this Sermon on the Mount, yes, he taught it, but don't think of it just as a one time, once for all, he had everybody together, they heard it once, and either learn it or lose it. He continually taught this. He taught it that day, but he continually taught this. He would keep going back to the subject matter and over and over and over again during his, his ministry. Yes, he laid it out first at the beginning, kind of like a lesson plan, but then he reinforced it. If you've ever taught someone the times tables, is you haven't sat down for 10 minutes and go, okay, got it? Good. You go over it and go over it. And these are core teachings that Jesus is doing, and he goes over and over and over again. So when we're taking time on the Sermon on the Mount, even though we are hearing a sermon, we are hearing a sermon that was repeated over and over and over again. Some people of an older generation would know the name Billy Graham. Maybe even the younger generation know of it, but don't know much about it. Uh, Billy Graham typically had a, a repertoire of maybe two dozen sermons. Uh, and he gave them over and over again. And he contextualized them in different situations. But he just had a core teaching that he did over and over and over again. As we look to the Sermon on the Mount, we're looking at a core teaching of Jesus that was continually repeated. So if you've read it once, don't think, oh, I've got it. Go back and read it again. Because Jesus continually went back and taught it again. So... First thing he says, the first thing he says when he's got everybody all gathered together, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail, but to use the word are is kind of an English word that we use to try and make sense of something that was written in a different language. More precisely in Aramaic, where Jesus was teaching, it would say, uh, blessed of the poor in spirit. Uh, speaking of in general terms, we use the word are as kind of a, a placekeeper, but there is the sense in this, rather than um, the nature of the person, there is a powerful concept of the blessedness of the state the person finds himself in. Um, blessed in, in Greek the word is makarios M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S go back and watch it on video M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S and makarios um, means a full completeness like it's a joy that is uh, self-contained some of our military folk, um, some of our retired military folk, have anyone ever served in Cyprus? Do we have anybody here that served in Cyprus or been to Cyprus? Well, Cyprus is called, um, uh, the, the, the people of the day would call Cyprus uh, he Makaria, which would mean Cyprus, the beautiful island, Cyrus, 
the completely joy-filled island. The concept was as if you lived in Cyprus, you had anything you would ever need. You would never have to leave the boundaries of it. It was beautiful. It was self-contained. It was a place where you could experience everything. And there's no need to look beyond its borders. That makarios, makaria, is the concept of the blessedness that we see Jesus using in these parables, in this teaching, especially in this beatitude. And this makarios uh, talks about a joy that is within itself. It's not a happiness that's depending upon the happenings, but there is a, a blessedness, there is a joy that is self-contained, that is untouchable, unassailable, that is complete right there. And he says that those that are experiencing these different types of states of mind and states of experience, they are in their very nature already self-contained, full of joy. Now, I tell you, many people wouldn't say, oh, I feel full of joy because I'm poor in spirit. But there is a, a depth to this onion that as you break through, Jesus shows us why that is so powerful. There's two words used for poor typically in this, this time. There's one poor that's kind of the working poor. And if you're working poor, it means if you miss a day's work, you may not have enough food for your family for the week. That's poor. But then there's another word for poor, which is abject poverty, which is uh, to, to use the same phrase as to cower or to, 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 um, to crouch down. Uh, under the weight of so much poverty. That's actually the word that's used here when they talk about the poor or the poverty of spirit. Poor is, uh, we're going to look at that in just a moment, but, but the concept of poor kind of grew over the years. Kind of like if, if we would say a beggar. If we talk about a beggar, we're not just talking about somebody that stands out in front and, and begs for something. There's a whole persona tied to a beggar in many people's mind, right? And, and it's built over time, and uh, maybe a beggar is this because of, because of, because of. Well, what we see here in the concept of poor that's used in the Hebrew is this concept of poor is, uh, has gone from being someone that's poor to the next step, well, someone that's poor that doesn't really have any power or influence, to, well, someone that's poor that doesn't have any power or influence, that therefore gets downtrodden by other people. And then it goes from somebody that's poor, someone that has no influence, someone that's been downtrodden by other people, to the point of, so therefore they have become now completely dependent upon God because they have no other resource to pull upon. That's the progression of poverty in the Hebrew mind. So when we see here, blessed are the poor in spirit, they are talking about someone who is not just in a physical state, but somebody that has come to the spiritual state where they are now dependent upon God. They recognize their own helplessness and they trust God. They are completely free from worldly things to attach to, so therefore they can attach and cling fully to God as their security. And in so doing, they're able to fully do God's will uh, because they aren't consumed with something else that they should be doing. There is a poverty in spirit that is actually, Jesus calls it, beautiful and blessed. When we get to that point in our lives, when God is the only thing that we can cling to and no other treasure on earth competes with him, that is a poorness of spirit that is actually beautiful. The next thing we see is, blessed are those who mourn, so they shall be comforted. It's not blessed are those that are crying, blessed are those that are sad, blessed are those that mourn. The word for mourn is the word that talks about as missing a loved one uh, who recently died, or feeling very similar to it. When Jacob uh, in the Old Testament, when Jacob was told his favorite child, as everyone could say, Joseph was Jacob's favorite child, the one with the coat of many colors. When Jacob was told that um, Joseph was gone, he mourned with the same type of word. He, he had a, a huge, overwhelming grief. And if you have ever mourned, 
and most of us have. If you've ever mourned, it is not something where you would naturally say, boy, am I blessed. Boy, do I feel joy in the midst of this mourning. In mourning, there are, however, lessons for the heart. There, there's a, a proverb that says, all sunshine leads to creating a desert. If it always is sunny, it will lead to a desert. So there are times, difficult times, where in grief we experience some things that we don't experience unless we are in grief or in mourning. In grief, we experience the kindness of others. We're open to the kindness and expressions that's offered to us from others. In our grief, we are open to and experience the compassion of God. In grief and in mourning, it takes life from the superficial level of, oh, I'm doing this and I have this activity and look at my new X, Y, or Z and here's my next dream to what is the purpose of all of this? And it, it takes life to a soul level rather than a superficial level. Now, uh, as we've just gone through the beatitude that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, it's a reminder that we are to detach from things, but we are never to detach from people. Um, we, grief is love enduring. And when we, and when we mourn, uh, it reminds us that we care for and we suffer and we sorrow because we have loved others. And in mourning, it shows our caring and our concern for others. But there's also another level to this mourning that when we realize our mourning is not just for the death of someone that we love or, or, or the loss of, of that relationship, but when we take it to another level and we realize that there is or there is or should be mourning when we realize the cost of our sin and how our sin has led to the death of Christ on the cross. The awareness of our sin and our broken heart uh, causes us to see the cross in a different way, causes us to see God in a different way. When we go through loss, we see a father whose son was given so that we could be in relationship with him. And we realize that our sin um, led to his death. But then we also see that from his death came our life. And God offers us his comfort in the midst of those times. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek. Boy, a lot of people don't want to put that on their Tinder profile. I'm meek. <laughs> Come meet me. Right? Meek is a phrase that's, that's lost its power today. We often think of meek as being spineless, as, as being a pushover, as being just a little mouse in the midst of a rat race. And meek, meek isn't much in today's world, but meek in its core is a, is a key virtue, especially amongst the the, the thinkers of the time, Aristotle in, in, in pre-Christian time, Aristotle was someone that thought meekness was a great powerful thing. It was, a, it was an amazing virtue. Because meekness at its core means that everything is under control. Imagine that. Everything is under control. You're not thrown around like waves in the sea. When you're meek, it means that every instinct, every impulse... Every passion is God-controlled, not even self-controlled, because self-controlled would mean that you're leaning upon your pride, look upon me, but to be God-controlled. A humility comes from meekness. When you've lived and, and you've sought to, to bring your life under the control of God, that humility shows you that you are teachable. Um, a professor was once presented with a whole bunch of high-achieving students that had just been uh, accepted into his course. And they said, isn't this a great class? He goes, yes. He said, the first thing I've got to do, though, is I've got to teach them what they don't know and teach them that they don't know everything because they already think they do. Meekness shows us that we still have much to learn, and therefore I am teachable by you, God, and that 
uh, you in your power can transform me even more and bring more and more meekness, gentle power into my life. The spirit of gentleness, it leads us to an ability to lead and to serve with power and we can grow exponentially in our lives as we submit ourselves to his control and let his meekness rule through us. And in so doing, we'll inherit the earth. We will be the leaders and the servants that God's called us to be amongst his people. Because if we uh, cannot control ourselves, how will we be given dominion to help in lead and serving others from a pure motive? The next, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, so they shall be filled. I think most of us would say we know what it feels like to be hungry. I think most of us would say we know what it's like to be thirsty. I think that the majority of us have no clue what it's like to be hungry or thirsty when we're talking about 2,000 years ago in Galilee and in Jerusalem and as a desert area. Some of our soldiers, maybe, and our military who have served in uh, places that are active deserts may, when they have a sandstorm come up and they're trying to get the sand out of their nostrils and out of their throat and they're gasping for water, they might. But there's certainly places in the world right now where there are people that are dying of hunger and thirst every day on the edge of starvation. We're not talking about peckish. You know, like, hmm, I had breakfast and lunch is going to be another couple hours. I really could use a snack. It's not that hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's the desperation of I haven't eaten, I haven't drank. As the deer pants for the water, So my soul longs after you, the psalmist says in Psalm 42. And in this, we see uh, that this longing for righteousness is powerful. This longing for living right, for godliness, is a desire. Not just to have a little bit of it, but to have all of it. To go to our um, grammar again, our grammar people will love this. The phrase that they use there is that to hunger and thirst, they actually use the direct accusative of the verb, which means not that uh, I I want the water as being a cup of water, I want the whole pitcher of water. Not I want some, some bread as in a slice of bread, I want the whole loaf of bread. So it's those that hunger and thirst for all righteousness, not just some of it. Not just the frosting on the cake, I want to have a good life, and I want to be a little bit godly. I want to be godly, and the good life isn't my focus. I just want to be godly. And if that means a good life, that means a good life. It means a good life in my godliness as I seek to do the right thing under God. And my comfort and all the other things that I lean upon to give me identity, I push aside because I hunger and thirst first and foremost to be right with God, to live in right relationship with God. I don't want to be just a little bit better. I'm desperate for completeness. Blessed are those who have that desire. And it's not even those that satisfy it. Can you hear this? It's those that want it. It's those that want it. If it was only those that achieved it, no one would be blessed but it's those that desire it and those that want it. Is that your heart's desire? Is that what you really want? God blesses you in that, right in this moment, not once it's been achieved, but even now that desire is what he seeks to to reward in you and that you experience the joy in it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Merciful, mercy, forgiveness, core teaching in Christianity. We spent a while um, back a couple months ago looking at the Lord's Prayer. And uh, the Lord's Prayer is right in the core of the Sermon on the Mount. So actually when we get to that point, uh, as we're going through this series, I'll just say, go back and watch the videos from the summer. <laughs> but one of the key teachings from, from the Sermon on the Mount is that uh, from, from the Lord's Prayer in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount is that forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. There is core teaching. When Jesus is coming and teaching, he is, he is taking the Hebrew concept, and he's taking them from, you remember how you've heard eye for eye, tooth for tooth? No. 
Now, I say this. If you want to be forgiven, you forgive. James 2, 13 is core in that. It talks about how uh, those who receive no mercy are those that offer no mercy in judgment. To be merciful is to have a deliberate effort of the mind and the will. And it does this. To be merciful, it doesn't mean like, oh, that's okay. Or I'm going to overlook that. This concept of mercy is extremely, extremely powerful and difficult. Have you heard of the expression, put yourself in someone else's shoes? This concept says, put yourself in another person's skin and mind and heart and past and concepts. That's the kind of mercy it's talking about. So that uh, when, when you are seeking to be merciful, full of mercy, uh, then you are deliberately taking on what do they, how come they responded the way they did, and what do they need? That's another one. What do they need? I was reading through commentaries. I've been reading through a lot of commentaries on this series, trust me. And one of the ones I read was by uh, William Barclay. And, and he was talking about how to be merciful is to use the illustration of Jesus when he met with Mary and Martha. And Mary, he was getting ready to, to go on in his ministry, and he had a really rough road ahead of him, to put it mildly. And Mary and Martha were there, and, and Martha was looking at Jesus, and, and she was like, oh, my friend is here, my guest is here, I want to make him a meal. He needs a meal. And so she goes about clanging all the pans, doing all that she can to make sure he has a meal. But what Jesus needed when he looked to his future is he just needed time with his friends. He just needed time to get, like a meal was secondary to him. What he needed was just to fellowship with Mary and Martha, his friends, and just to be with them. You ever, you ever had experiences like that? Maybe you've had holidays or celebrations where what you've really wanted and needed is just time with your loved ones. But instead, there's this desire like, but they're here, so I need to make a meal, and it has to be good, and we need the linens, and hurry up, get that in. Why is that? You've lost the whole concept <laughs> of why you're gathering together. To be merciful is to put yourself in someone else's shoes and say, what do they need? So the merciful thing was what Mary picked up on. Jesus just needs me to be me and, and to sit and, and enjoy his presence. Martha, although she was doing great things, she wasn't actually merciful because she wasn't putting herself purely definition-wise in Jesus' skin and saying, oh, what does he need? Let's provide that for him. To be merciful is to reflect the very nature of God. Because when you can put yourself in someone else's skin and body, it makes forgiveness so much more easier, wouldn't it? If you really understood that person, then forgiveness would be so much easier. And we go, oh, pastor. <laughs> well, I just point to the master. I point to Jesus, who's being taken and being crucified. Crucified. Worst death ever you can experience. Shame, stripped, bare, beaten, flogged. Carry your own device of death with you. And as he's being nailed to the cross, he looks to the soldiers that are crucifying him. And he says... Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How many of you in your pain would look out to the person causing your pain and say, God, forgive them? That's a whole different level, isn't it? But that's exactly what Jesus did. He's our model. Why? Because he knew what those Roman soldiers were doing. He knew what they were told to do. He knew that they would be disciplined, possibly killed, if they didn't do the orders that they were given. He knew that they didn't recognize him, that he was the Lord, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ. And he knew they were doing their job. 
And as hard as that was and how much pain it brought on him, he still, out of his mercy, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God came as a man from mercy to show us mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart, cath- um, catharos. Anybody ever heard of the word cathartic? Right? Something very cleansing, something very freeing. That's, that's the word that's used here for the pure in heart. Blessed are the catharos of the heart. Blessed are those that have a heart that is pure, a heart that is cleansed. Uh, it's, it's a phrase that's used to describe you know, how you clean your laundry, uh, how you sift your wheat from your chaff or your corn to make sure it's pure. It's how you uh, make sure that the, the uh, tin, uh, sorry, the, the silver is not alloyed with anything else. It, it, it's a purification uh, of an unmixed nature so that there's nothing mixed about it. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those that have a heart with unmixed motives has a heart that is pure, that is one direction, that's not double-hearted, two-faced, etc. But has, has one pure, direct motive. And boy, that is hard. Because to have a heart like that means that you've got to pull yourself away from any selfishness and completely be selfless. To use a pastor example, there's the story of John Bunyan, who was actually not just a lumberjack, but a preacher. And uh, John Bunyan uh, was coming down from the pulpit after he had preached an excellent sermon. And he was coming down. Uh, one of the congregation members came up to him and said, boy, that sermon was great. And John Bunyan looked and he frowned. He goes, yeah, I know. The devil told me on the way down the steps. <laughs> because it was a reminder that, oh, good, now you can be proud of yourself. Now let that root take in so that you can have a mixed motive rather than a pure heart. These things exist, um, and they're always a challenge against us. When we give something to someone, great heart. Are you offended when you don't get a thank you card? Mixed motive. When you give something for charity, and you don't get anything in return, no photo op, no tax receipt, know nothing? Do you feel like, oh, well, it wasn't exactly what I planned on doing. Mixed heart, mixed motive. To not expect anything in return and to just do from pure giving, from, from a purity of, of, of heart desire, that is what Jesus looks upon. And he says, those are the ones that see God because those are the ones that are reflecting him the most. I'm going to fly through here. Sorry. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Oh, great concept of peace in, in the Old Testament. It's called shalom. Some of you have heard that word, shalom. And peace does, does not mean, oh, just the absence of trouble. But the peace that it talks about is not absence of trouble, but the fullness of goodness, and the fullness of goodness so much that you don't feel anything bad because you are just enjoying the goodness of life so much. That is the peace that is described here. And, and the peace that we see here is that uh, these are the people that make peace. These are the ones that um, uh, the, they are actively looking in relationships to bring peace, the peace of God and the peace um, amongst uh, relationships amongst one another. It's the very work of God. It's the highest task to restore and redeem relationships. Peacemakers are opposed to another group of people. Troublemakers. Right? Which camp do you fall upon? Are you a troublemaker? Are you a peacemaker? Are you looking to bring peace amongst people? Or are you looking to bring trouble amongst people? Are you looking to redeem and restore relationships? Or are you looking to divide and conquer relationships? God says that those that have the, the desire to, to bring peace amongst situations... The ones that uh, refuse to give in to bitterness and stink eye can live, um, cannot live without 
um, the ones that can't live without conflict, those are the ones that God says, no, no. Those that seek to bring about peace at whatever cost, and typically personal cost, those are the ones that are doing my very work. And actually says, they shall be called sons of God. And that phrase is used to describe the people that are doing the very nature of, of God's will. So not so much that they will become biological males of God, <laughs> but they will become the people that do God's work and they're, re they're reflected upon and, and carry his name forward uh, in glory and properly. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To the Christ follower, you can expect over the centuries of following Christ, you can expect as you, as you seek to live out what Christ calls us to, as we see through the Sermon on the Mount, you can expect there to be work issues. Uh, people at work won't quite align with uh, the way you live and, and the choices you make. And it may affect your, uh, not necessarily employability, but your mobility within, within your workplace. It may affect your social life, how, uh, who you hang with and, and, and the activities that you do. It may affect your home life. Maybe you are the one that is dedicated and given your life to Christ, and you're living with others in your family that haven't. There will be tensions that will arise from that. So the point in some homes where there is um, complete rejection. Um, and the persecution can go through the, ban um, the gambit of, of, of different types of persecution. Um, the early church was slandered as being cannibals, right? This is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. People would listen in and go, oh, there are a bunch of cannibals there. They're, they're, they're just eating one another. They would hear about the love feast that we gather together where we come and celebrate what God has done. Oh, that's just a big sexual thing that they're doing. Uh, they would be viewed as inciting terrorists and zealots that, you know, the, the, this Christian movement, they're, they're seeking uh, to, to undermine uh, and, and, and to kill and destroy, and, and especially to undermine the state and the government, because they're not going to honor the, the king. They're not going to honor the emperor. They're not going to honor uh, the, the, the things, because they have a higher authority than, than what the king says. And they were persecuted for those different types of things. And in their persecution, they suffered a lot. It goes on to say, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say kinds of evil or falsely against you. But then it says this, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. To suffer for your faith, not for, not for your own emotions, not for somebody said something bad to me, but to, to suffer for your faith because you sought to live out Jesus and someone did not like what Jesus was calling you to do when your pride is not involved. That is when you are in the closest possible companionship with Jesus because you're walking his path. When you're enduring the insults, the mockery, the demotions, you are at the same time concurrently experiencing the crown of glory that's placed upon you. The scriptures tell us that Jesus, for the glory set before him, endured the cross, suffering its shame. To know in the midst of the suffering that you'll go through as a Christian, by the way, newsflash, to follow Christ means they're suffering. You might not have ever heard that, especially in, in, in the gospel that is proclaimed, come and follow Jesus, it'll all be good. There is a lot of good in following Jesus, but there's suffering to get through to it. But in the suffering you learn, in the suffering you grow, in the suffering you are not alone, in the suffering, the scriptures tell us, you are blessed even in it. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it encourages us, it reminds us, it refreshes us, it challenges us, but God, it blesses us. So we thank you for your word. May it take root in our hearts. May it take root in our minds. Lord, uh, when we feel broken, we thank you that you tell us we are blessed. Lord, when we mourn and we grieve, we thank you that we are comforted. God, when we so desire peace, we thank you that you will help us to be peacemakers as you offered your peace to us, that complete peace. 
Lord, as we seek to be merciful. Thank you that you placed yourself in our skin so that we could do the same for others and offer forgiveness and love and caring as you've called us to. But Lord, most of all, help us to hunger and thirst for you with a pure heart so that we may see you and that we may uh, experience the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you stand with us, please, as we close?